who's joining me here. She's the other person you can see. Um, hi, Margo. Hey, Lily. Uh, <laughs> how's it going? Oh, it's going great. Great. Um, I'm going to very quickly introduce you, and then we're super excited to dive right into your presentation on the book, Dairy City. Uh, Memory and Political Struggle in Northern Ireland, which was published by um, the Notre Dame Press. So, Margot Shea is uh, trained in urban studies, public and oral history, qualitative research methods, and some of the digital humanities. She received her PhD from the Mass University of Massachusetts Amherst and her bachelor's from the University of Pennsylvania. She's been studying Irish history for quite some time and has focused a lot on the Troubles and Derry specifically. She's been there many times. She knows many people. We're hoping some of them are watching right now. Hello, Derry. Um, she's an historian and she also is a professor of history at Salem State University in Salem, Massachusetts. So uh, without further ado, Margo. I've Thanks, heard it. Lily. Uh, thank you so much. Lily did not say that she's an alum of our history program at Salem State, and I will absolutely take this opportunity to point that out because she was a shining star then, and she's a shining star still. So I'm really happy to be here, and it it makes me feel a little bit old um, to have you so professional and kind of organizing this event, but I'm also really grateful and just happy um, to be able to spend some time with you and to be able to talk about the book. I'm so, also excited. Um, Derry, if you're watching, go to bed. It's late. <laughs> you got to get up in the morning. COVID's over where you are because you all did the right thing. Um, so without further ado, I want to um, tell you all a little bit about my book. I have a few images to share. Nothing wild. But, uh, let's see here. As always, there we go. Um, so when I arrived in Derry uh, for the first time in 1998, I was not an historian by any means. And if you had told me that someday I would write a history of Derry City, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Um, but I had studied cities in college, as Lily said. Um, I was in Derry right after the peace agreement was signed. Um, and I was there to do community-based work out of McGee College, and I paid really close attention to the urban landscape, um, how it was organized, how people moved around it, who seemed to belong, what exclusion looked like and how it worked, um, how people interacted with each other. And I was really fascinated um, by the ways that the past and the present mingle in the landscape in Derry. It's true in, in every city. Um, but it was really pronounced in Derry. Um, Derry still bears um, the marks of its really long history um, from its stone walls that reflect its status as a plantation city to the stories behind those walls that suggest that the stones themselves were taken from um, a Catholic temple or a Catholic church that had been torn down um, as plantation was underway in the 17th century. Um, Derry also bears marks of the past in really simple ways like this um, well, St. Columns well. Here's a picture you see on one side of the well today. And there's another picture there um, that actually shows up in my book. It was taken by Willie Carson um, of the same well in the same spot uh, in the 1940s. So, so many images of Derry um, are in black and white. Um, they're somber. And I think that it's because um, so many of the images that we're familiar with kind of come from the era of the civil rights movement and the troubles. And that was the film that people had access to. And a lot of the folks who were shooting those images were journalists. And so you have this kind of black and white 
um, color scape of the city of Derry. And of course, pop culture picked up that black and white color scape. And so I think for a lot of people, um, Derry City sort of lives in that kind of black and white. Um, but the Derry that I came to know was incredibly colorful. It was also um, and is really warm and friendly. Um, for example, if you passed someone in the street, they would be very likely to say hello to you. And they might also kind of wonder who you were and where you were going, but they would always say hello. And I remember um, when I got to Derry, I was so confused when um, a, a man, um, usually older than me, but a man that I didn't know would say hello in the street. He would sort of do this kind of um, like nervous tick, you know, He'd go, yes, what about you? Yes, hi. And I, I didn't know what it was. And I was really like, what, what's going on here? And then I started doing it because I was like, well, that's what people in Derry do. So if I'm going to say hello to people on the street, I'm going to nod my head. Um, and finally, a friend of mine kind of let me in on the history of this. And he said, Margo, um, you know what's happening here? The, this is actually um, a remnant from when men wore caps. And when they passed a woman on the street, particularly a woman they thought was attractive or they just wanted to be polite, they would you know, doff their cap and say, yes, or what about you? Um, and, and so now they still do it. They don't wear the caps. So it's just the gesture itself. Um, and that's just one example of the way the past lived in the present in the dairy that I came to know. Um, but I also noticed when I arrived there um, that community is not abstract, right? It's lived. Um, everyone's in and out of each other's pockets. If you've seen Dairy Girls, then you know that opening, right? Where Erin's in the bathtub and Orla's reading from her diary. Um, super not far-fetched. Like it's it, in the dairy that I came to know um, over the past 20 years, life is with people. Even when they drive you around the bend, it is with people. Um, so the dairy that I came to know and the dairy that I write about in my book, Dairy City, is not black and white. Um, it's definitely in color. Um, I remember as soon, you know, soon after I got to Dairy, uh, probably a month or so after I had arrived in the fall of 98, Seamus Heaney was speaking at the Central Library. Um, here he was, you know, the great man himself. And you would think that the room would be full of kind of folks being reverent, um, the, the tweed jackets with elbow patches crowd. My husband would call them the yes, yes crowd, um, but not in Derry. Everybody was packed in from kids to teenagers to the Oldenheimers who hung out at the library all the time. Um, I, I'll never forget people like local historian Mickey McGinnis sitting in the front row, um, right, you know, just a meter from Heaney, calling out requests to poems um, that Heaney had written 40 years before. And Heaney's up there bantering away, giving Mickey stick, saying, Ah, Mickey, will you never tire of that old poem? And Mickey would say, Oh, no, definitely not. Um, the past lived in Heaney's poems. The past lived in the banter. And just like the men um, with the dairy nod and the ghosts of their caps, the past was pervasive. It was woven into daily life. It was like a melody that you can't get out of your head, um, even for someone like me who didn't know the words. When I decided that I wanted to work on this project and commit um, time and energy and scholarly study to working on this project, it was like I really wanted to know the words to that song, to Derry's song. Um, and you know, if you're a fan of Derry Girls, I, I think you know what I mean, because you're enmeshed in that kind of melody when you watch the show. There's all these little things, right? There's the wee baby, the wee in, in the corner, the baby's in almost every scene, and they never talk about whose baby it is. Um, no one ever seems to be paying it any attention. Apparently it's Aaron's wee sister. Um, you know, there's Uncle Colum, and Uncle Colum is so boring that you would probably rather watch Wallpaper Peel then listen to Uncle Colum, but somehow, you know, he's a part, he's the, he's the backbeat 
of that city. And then there's Mary's dad, Joe, who absolutely can't stand her husband, mostly as far as we can tell, because he's, he's a dub, he's from Dublin. Um, these are all these kinds of things that make the, that show come alive um, for anyone watching it, but they also kind of remind me of that melody of Derry. Um, it, believe it or not, it was a book um, that brought me to Derry or compelled me to want to go to Derry in the first place. I know like I'm such a dork. Um, Tony Doherty would say that I was chasing a boy who lived in England, but like I had already realized that he was an idiot. Um, and it was this book that brought me uh, to, to Derry. Reading in the Dark by Seamus Dean. It's a great book. I really recommend it. Um, and I'm I want to talk about it today because it was a story in this book that provided the inspiration for the history of memory that I wrote um, in my book, Derry City. Really early on in the book, there's this scene. It's called The Accident. Um, and in the scene, the narrator is watching a little boy that he knew named Rory Hannaway trying to leap onto the back of a lorry. Um, and he wanted to catch a lift somewhere, right? And so he's just like poised on the, you know, waiting to jump on the back of this lorry. And unexpectedly, the driver of the lorry reversed very suddenly and very quickly. And as you can imagine, this did not work out well for young Hannaway. He ended up kind of slipping under the wheel. Um, the narrator was watching the whole thing. He was standing on a wall and he essentially watched this incredibly gruesome car accident. Um, and he watched as the police arrived. And if you know anything about Northern Ireland in the 1940s or the 1950s, you know that in a Catholic neighborhood in the bog side where Seamus Dean was from and where he was writing about, the police were kind of um, persona non grata. They were um, people of whom you would be very careful and you would try very hard not to ever get their attention, right? You also saw them um, in some ways as, if not the enemy, certainly uh, not your friend. So Dean's here, he's the narrator of the story. He watches the police drive up and he sees one of the cops, you know, arrive on the scene and just react with this visceral emotional um, trauma to the scene on the ground. Um, and he went behind the lorry and he actually threw up. Right, it was just, it was this reaction. And Dean says, his distress reached me airborne like a smell. Um, the narrator felt sorry for the police officer. Um, and you're not supposed to feel sorry for a police officer if you're in that, in, in that place. So a few months later, Danny Green told the narrator the story of what happened to Rory Hannaway um, and, and the Lori. Um, except in, in Danny Green's story, there was no lorry. In Danny Green's story, the cops came flying down the street and they ran over Danny, um, Rory Hannaway, and they never even stopped, right? So the crazy thing was the narrator identifies feeling better. Um, instead of feeling sympathy for the police, which was you know, a really uncomfortable feeling, he started to feel really sorry for Rory's mother. And he started to feel really sorry for that lorry driver, the truck driver who hadn't worked since. So it was in this story um, that the folklorist Henry Glassie's argument about memory um, kind of came to life for me. Glassie said that in Northern Ireland, um, stories about the past kind of serve to coordinate multiple responsibilities to time, to the past events themselves, to the present situation and to the future of the community. In other words, what Glassie was saying is that memory is not recall, right? It's, it's not just about what happened. Um, and it also lit a light bulb in my head because it kind of showed me that maybe memory wasn't just a problem, right? And as someone who has studied history, um, anybody out there who studies history will know that for a long time, historians kind of held their nose um, up against memory, right? Um, it's fallible. It's malleable. You can't trust it. 
um, there's all these reasons why memory is the quintessential uh, unreliable narrator, right? To use kind of um, a, a literary term. So um, memory and historical consciousness have been talked about a lot specifically in Irish history and also in histories of Northern Ireland um, and in conversations about picking up the pieces and moving on, building a more robust, a more pluralistic, a more open culture in Northern Ireland in the wake of the troubles. Memory is really seen as divisive um, because people carry these different interpretations of the past and then they use those interpretations to project ideas and values um, onto the real world, right? So for all like these reasons and more that I go into um, in the introduction to the book, the whole idea of memory um, in Northern Irish history was like a big what not to do, um, you know, stop, put the memory down, leave the memory alone. Um, but there was that scene in reading in the dark, remembering, you know, the narrator, felt relief at remembering the events wrong, differently. He, rem <clears throat> he remembered them in a way that might have been unfaithful to what happened, but he remembered them in a way that corresponded with the world that he knew. And here's the thing. The world was true, even if the memory was wrong, right? The world was true. The world with the police trained to consider Catholics who were the demographic majority in the city of Derry um, as a suspicious group after partition when Northern Ireland was predominantly a unionist and therefore Protestant province. Um, it was true in a world where um, police felt that it was possible that Catholics um, in the North were intent on undermining the legibility, the um, legitimacy of the province itself, because they were all assumed to support the free state, which is what the rest of Ireland was called um, in the wake of the war of Irish independence. Um, so the world with the truck driver out of a job, um, th that world was true. The world with the grieving mom, that world was true. So the memory was wrong, but the fact that the memory got kind of massaged in order to fit with the world, um, I found absolutely and totally fascinating. Um, and this is really what kind of got me into this project, the idea that memory is not about recall, right? It's, it's a creative act. Um, and memories are always changing. Your memories, my memories, um, a community or a constituency's memories are always changing to respond to and also to suit um, current events. Um, so I also kind of realized through studying um, that memory is really social, right? The knowledge, the values, the perceptions um, that your community thinks is important and necessary are always kind of going to be reiterated and upheld through memories, even your own private memories. So um, if you find something like that is taboo, it's, you're not gonna talk about it. And the less you talk about it, it's very possible that it will recede in your memory itself. And that might happen with individuals, that might happen with societies. Um, but the idea that memory is kind of, um, it's, it's moving, it's creative, it's active, also um, leads to the point that, um, the things that historians hate about memory, um, that it doesn't, it, it doesn't accurately convey what happened in the past, um, that it's always changing, that you can manipulate it, kind of also made memory really fascinating from a different perspective, if you flip it, right? People always say that commemorations and memory um, correlate with a lot of surprising accuracy to what people are thinking about, feeling, worrying over, hoping for in the present. Um, so this made me think a lot about voice and power, right? Um, people who, people with power hold the mic. People with power pass laws. 
people with power have access to the archive, people with power are the gatekeepers to the archives. Um, history, which is supposed to be value neutral and objective, the opposite of memory, right? It's everything memory is not, is usually built on an interpretation of records and sources that often reflect the versions of events um, that were held by people with power. So, you know, for an example, when I went to Derry, I actually thought the official name of the city was Londonderry and that uh, the Catholics of Derry during the, um, during the troubles sort of slashed off London as a way to kind of excise um, that from their name. Um, and, and what I found out when I was, you know, living in Derry is that in fact, it was exactly the opposite. Um, Derry or Dara is Gaelic for Oak Grove. And it was um, the second name of the city. The, the first name was Dara, the Oak Grove of Calgac. Um, the, the name of the city until plantation was Dara Column Kill, the Oak Grove of Column Kill, who's Derry's patron saint. Um, and so the, the London was added on um, in the early, like 1613, 1614, um, during the plantation um, of Ulster, and it was representing the relationship between um, the London guilds and the new plantation project in the northwest of Ireland. Um, and I, I think it's like it's a little bit like what's happening in Kenosha. Um, Trump and Biden both went to Kenosha, and um, you know Biden didn't say you know it's okay to loot and tear things down. Um, but he did acknowledge the history of slavery. That's kind of the original, um, the original sin or the wound. Um, and so these kinds of acknowledging of power and acknowledging of pasts that haven't always been connected to stories that we tell um, is something that I've, I'm really interested in. And it's something that comes up over and over and over again in Dairy. So if memory is suggestible, if it's so dependent on um, the people who are remembering what they're thinking about, what they're worrying about, um, and if memory reflects a world that's true, even if it rearranges the facts, then I thought maybe memory could be like a ticket um, to help me understand what was going on in, for Catholics and nationalists in Derry um, who didn't leave behind a lot of historical records and who didn't have remembrance sort of built into the landscape with memorials and monuments um, until really the period of the troubles. Most of you are familiar with the murals and the Bogside artists. Um, and that's, an, that's a um, period after which I think you really see nationalist and Catholic dairy represented in the cityscape itself. Um, but I was really interested in an earlier period. And so I decided that I would follow um, memory like breadcrumbs and in doing that, I sort of stumbled into a social and cultural history of dairy using Catholics memories and historical consciousness as my lens. Um, and I think that um, the book begins right in during the furor over um, home rule and then um, the interruption during the First World War and then the fight for Irish independence. And it takes the story through the partition of Ireland and the creation of the province of Northern Ireland. Um, and it looks at that story from the perspective um, of the Catholic majority, because Derry Catholics were the majority demographically in the city since 1850. Um, and so even though they didn't have a lot of political power or resources um, for reasons that were certainly orchestrated um, or intentional in some cases, and in other cases that's debatable, um, but you take the story um, from partition into this period when um, Catholics in Derry were sort of seen as a, a, a suspicious community because it was assumed that they would wanna undermine um, the province of Northern Ireland. And so um, as a result, they weren't really eligible for employment in the kinds of jobs that would have been, um, have anything to do with the state. Right. If you if your postal if your postal worker, to use a current example, um, is really interested in tearing down the infrastructure of the state itself, then do you think your mail is going to get delivered? Probably not. That was unionists' um, logic for not hiring Catholics 
um, to work as postal service workers or to not do it in large numbers. Um, and I carry the story up through the Second World War and lead into um, the era of the 1960s, the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland um, and the, the beginning of the troubles in 1969. And so in some ways my book is a prequel to the story of civil rights and the troubles, but it's also kind of a way of looking at that story differently. Um, essentially for all the reasons that I've said, there's kind of been a standard interpretation um, about Catholics in Northern Ireland during that period between partition um, and the civil rights movement. And it was basically sort of like, you know, people were, um, politically immobile and impotent, um, and Catholics sort of represented an apathetic community. Um, and you hear that when people talk about Eddie McAteer, and they call him half a loaf Eddie, because he used to say things like half a loaf is better than no bread. Um, and these stories about the sort of um, the Catholics as kind of um, not, not losers, but sort of um, people whining from the sidelines of public life kind of got baked in to the story, partly because it makes the troubles and the civil rights movement really exciting and really interesting, right? If there's like nothing happening before that. Um, but, you know, when you look at the different variables and I, I call that memory work, um, then you start to see um, the, the story somewhat differently. So I just have a couple examples. They're kind of random. Um, as I went back and forth to Derry um, over the years and I began to see the ways that memory shifted over time, I was able to periodize this um, according to um, those major time periods that I just talked about. Um, here's just one example. St. Columns College is kind of famous um, for Irish people and Irish Americans because it's graduated a lot of, it's a boys school, it's graduated men um, who became very famous. It graduated John Hume um, who just passed and um, Seamus Heaney who I talked about, Seamus Dean who wrote Reading in the Dark. Um, Brian Friel went to St. Columns College, Billy Kelly, Dermot Quinn, um, all, all these like really kind of um, people who've gone on to do good in the world and make the world a, a better place. Um, and here is a, um, a quote from 1929, the school was celebrating its 50th anniversary and here's Bishop O'Kane. And he says, the school can claim with much justice to be the lawful successor in faith and management, even in sight and surroundings of the glorious ancient seat of learning under the guidance of the very same patron. And what Bishop O'Kane was talking about, of course, is uh, St. Columba, Colum Kill, right? Who came to Derry and established um, an abbey and a monastery in the sixth century. So here you are in 1929 and um, as my friend Marla, who's also an historian, likes to say about this study of Derry, is the Catholics of Derry were always taking the long view. They would take the long view. And here they're connecting their little school um, that's trying to provide an education. It was the first school for um, Catholic boys that were not necessarily going to go into um, the seminary, right, who weren't going to um, take vocations. And here they are connecting it to this sixth century saint. Um, and I, think I had, oops, I had a couple of slides, but I think that's probably um, good. I the the book is full of so many different ways of um, using memory and talking about memory, from ghost stories and children's rhymes to parades and fetches. Um, to um, attempts to fly the, uh, the Irish tricolor flag, even though it was illegal to do so in Northern Ireland, and then flying it from the most vaulted um, symbol of Protestant unionist power in the city, Governor Walker's statue. Um, and so, you know, it's not just that the, the stories themselves are fantastic, which they are, um, but it's, all, it's also just kind of the way all the stories come together. 
um, and give you a different um, way of thinking about Catholics in Northern Ireland and about Derry City uh, in that period between partition and the civil rights movement. So that's what I got. Thank you so much, Margo. That was, um, gosh, that was awesome. Um, we've got a bunch of people uh, listening and um, commenting, I can say on the YouTube live. Um, no questions as of yet, just general like joy. I'm sorry, I don't know where my video is. Can you see me? I can see you. That's great news. Um, there I am. Uh, so, um, Thank you. That was a really fascinating presentation. I wish I had had a chance to actually read the book before now, but um, publishers, am I right? So um, I do have some questions that I'd like to ask. Uh, obviously, this is the question and answer portion. Um, and again, anyone watching, if you have questions that you would like me to ask Margot, you can feel free to comment on um, YouTube or on our Facebook um, the event for for this, uh, there's a discussion section you can post there and I'll be sure to throw those in. Um, okay, so Margo. <laughs> obviously Northern Ireland, the first thing that comes to mind usually is the Troubles and uh, like a million books have been written about the Troubles. So um, what specifically made you want to focus on everything that came before, aside from the fact that there are already a million books on the Troubles. So, um, yeah, that's a great question. I um, I started, I when I was uh, doing a, um, a master's degree in public history, I went back to Derry and there were um, some fantastic people at the Academy of Irish Cultural Heritages at McGee, and they were trying to kind of map the memory scape of Northern Ireland. Um, and so they were like, okay, we're gonna try to trace all the ways in which the past gets made concretized and present in the landscape. So street signs and placards and memorials and statues and murals, everything. They wanted to do everything. Um, and I was working in Derry and I was really, I was tracing Derry and I was, you know, like going through people's backyards to try to find um, murals to members of the INLA who had been felled in action. I was wandering through the city cemetery. I was um, getting friends who were, were belonged to the Protestant cathedral, St. Columns Cathedral to take me into the back um, where some of the, the, apprentice, the original apprentice boys um, from the siege of Derry were buried. And it just occurred to me like through this process that unionist Protestant Derry was so well represented um, in the landscape. It was everywhere. It was, it was everywhere. It was the walls, it was the names. There are these like keystones of the river gods um, that oversaw the rivers where these major um, Protestant victories took place. Um, and, and when I started like looking for Catholic memory, I was like, I, it's, not, it's not in the landscape, right? And that's the whole thing. It's a melody, it's a song. Um, and I also was, I, I was a writer, right? I, I wrote poetry. My best friends in Derry were from the writers groups that I belonged to. And so I was like constantly um, learning the history of Derry through the stories. Um, and it sounds really trite and really kind of twee and irish -y, um to say that, but that was what was happening. And, um, and I, I realized that the history was, um, it wasn't something that people thought they necessarily needed to write down because they lived in a stream of time where people stayed close to home and they valued family and they valued neighborhood and the, the memories and the stories and the history weren't leaving. Whereas as an American, I think I had a, a much like much higher respect for sort of official histories um, and concretized histories as a, um, an aid against forgetting, right? Like the, the fear is forgetting. Um, and so in some ways I was jealous of the way that dairy people kind of, you know, moved back and forth between the past and, um, and I wanted to know more about it. And I wanted to, I also 
really valued the local historians and the local writers and the storytellers um, who are Derry's past keepers um, in the nationalist and Catholic community in a lot of ways. Um, and, and I wanted to kind of give them academic and scholarly recognition as, as past makers and as historians. Um, and so citing them in an academic book may not be a big deal to them, but it's a really big deal to me um, because now like they're, they're on the record. Yeah. Um, you and I are both really into oral history and obviously also um, memory in history. Uh, but my question for people out there who may not think the same way that we do um, is how, you know, we're living in a time where just the word fact is being redefined. Um, and the story that you told about the lorry is like a great example. How do you continue using memory to, um, to teach history and to like create a historical record? How do you adequately contextualize it so that people don't just think the cops ran over a kid yeah. and didn't stop? Like how, cause you did a great job there. How do you think we can incorporate that into teaching, I guess? Mm -hmm. or, I mean, you know, it's like, it's like you've been um, in my head for the past few years and any of my students or former students who are watching, like they know, I'll, I stand up there and I basically am like, okay, I'm kind of having a crisis of conscience. I'm basically not sure I can do this anymore. Um, in the world of alternative facts and in the world of, you know, like whatever lie is loudest and gets the most hits on social media, um, it, it seems like this whole thing about memory is really dangerous, right? It's no longer, um, it, it's, it's taken on um, such a different tenor and tone because of um, the world in which we all have the mic through social media. And yet we need to also remember that there are algorithms and there are contexts and there are structures through which we speak and debate on the public forum. And those things are controlled um, by maybe people with power, as I said in, the, in my um, comments earlier. And so um, I do, grapple with this all the time. And I'm not sure um, if I was starting this project now, if I would think it's a, an ethical or reasonable thing to do. But I can say that in the context of Derry and Northern Ireland, um, it felt as if the memories were um, this alternative historical consciousness of people who didn't have the reins, who didn't have the control in yeah. order to pass laws, in order to fund what they thought was valuable and important, in order to get the message out there. So I guess it's always about asking those questions. Mm -hmm. You know, what's what's the forum? How's the message getting out there? Um, what are the people behind this this you know alternative interpretation um, seeking? What are they interested in? Are they seeking redress? Are they seeking justice? Or, or are they seeking something else, right? And mm -hmm. how have people like them um, been treated by historians in the past? And how have people like them been treated by those with power in the past? I guess those are all questions that you might consider when you're considering whether or not memory should be taken seriously or an interpretation should be taken seriously. But I'm sure you can totally appreciate um, how, how sticky and murky those categories are, as I certainly do. Yeah, I think it's such a great opportunity to use that in um, history, education, like elementary school, and up uh, to create um, more of a sense of experience in history instead of there is a like dry academic giving you the facts and they might convey to you the way that each side in a, an event was thinking, but um, they're doing it like a dry academic with the facts. Whereas memory, even again, like the Lori, um, even though that event 
was sort of rewritten, the context behind it is so important. I, I feel like it would help people um, be more interested in history. I, I hate it when people are like, oh, it's the most boring subject, because it's not. Um, and I think it would also help create um, more empathy in people, don't you think? Like, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So that it's not just something where you're memorizing names and dates and dumb stuff. It creates a, like a deeper meaning um, in history. That being said, um, I do wonder if uh, you kind of just answered this, but like if memory supplements the official record, who gets to decide what the official record is? Is it like, there's no specific answer to that, I think, in the room. I just am interested what you think. Yeah, you know, I, um, public historians, people who belong to the National Council for Public History, which is kind of the professional association, um, they wrangled with questions like that quite a lot when we were developing I and mean, I wasn't developing I did nothing but just read and appreciate but when the association was developing um, a statement on ethics and I, I can't remember if it was Denise Maringolo or if it was someone else but I know that in that discussion and in the document that came out of that there was this kind of very pointed um, statement that said that when in doubt, um, public historians needed to side um, with those who had been um, who had ex who, who had either it was like they had experienced injustice, they had um, there was evidence of their marginalization and their for whom the stakes, of this debate were materially higher, mm -hmm. right? And I and I remember like, you know, that was be, that was really helpful for me when I was living in Tennessee and involved in debates and conversations about Confederate memorials, right? It's like, who, okay, there are these different perspectives and there are these different historical interpretations and these memorials mean very different things to the people who are party to this controversy. But if you are going to have to kind of take a stand, um, the, the stand that you're going to take needs to address those larger histories, that larger context, and um, the, the use and misuse of power. Mm. Great does that answer. make sense? Yeah, it totally does. Um, and I, I agree. That's such a great yeah, that's great. Uh, YouTube is blowing up. We have a particular person who has um, about 20 questions for you. So I'm going to dive right in. Okay. Uh, first off, um, this person asks, what would you want to add to your book now that you are done? <sighs> you know, that's a great question. Um, I, it's really hard. I think in the wake of Lyra McGee's um, murder, I, I think that I, things that I was somewhat facile about, um, you know, and, and a little critical of other historians who were worried about giving um, any justification or legitimization to the Republican movement. Um, I, you know, I, I think that I wonder if I had been starting the project now, if the project would look different simply mm -hmm. because of that event mm -hmm. um, and, and because of the ways that dairy has changed. I mean, I think that's the other thing that's really important. The dairy of, of 2020 is not the dairy of 1998. It is a, it is a vastly changed place. And I would say that um, generally speaking, it is, it is for the better. Um, there are some things that I, I miss and there are some things that I'm sure other people miss um, about the old dairy, but um, that's nostalgia. And I, I generally think that um, the city is, it, it's just a radically different place. And it's, um, and it, and so I, you know, I, I don't know if these questions, I don't know if this book ever would have even um, happened, but um, in terms of sort of practical stuff, what did I, what did I miss? What did I wish that I had put in the book? Um, I wish that I had spent more time in the diocesan archives. I wish that I had known 
the questions to ask um, and kind of how to crack crack the code that was the late Bishop Dr. Um, Edward Daly, because I think that there's probably more stuff in there for another historian to write. So. Yeah. Um, another person comments, fascinating discussion. And uh, she asks, um, she's thinking a lot about the perceived power of one person's oral history versus another another's these days. And should we be taking greater care to contribute to and listen to oral histories? Should we be like creating more of an oral history record? That's a great question. Um, I think the, the short answer is yes. Um, we should be contributing to larger um, archives, but I think there's something embedded in that. Should we be listening more? Mm -hmm. And that's something I sort of, I say all the time, everyone's talking and nobody's listening um, and everybody wants to be heard. And the combination of like everyone talking, nobody listening, everybody feeling like they're not being heard is super toxic. Um, and, and I don't think it's just in an Irish context or in an American context. I think that's everywhere and everybody. Um, and, and I wonder a lot about what it means um, to cultivate an, an ethics of listening. Mm -hmm. And I, I know like um, Sadie Sullivan, who works at the Brooklyn Museum, she's done some really cool work within her community around this. And she's an oral historian. And I think she came to that sort of same point um, that it's a muscle. Listening is a muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to give like a shout out toward, um, to towards understanding and healing to Maureen Hetherington and Eamon Dean and people like Sarah Cook in Northern Ireland who built a reconciliation movement around listening and telling stories. And they brought people together from very different backgrounds, people who often would not have found themselves in the same room and who would have had a lot of reason at the outset to be suspicious of one another. Um, and they would kind of create safe spaces um, and create an environment and an intention um, to listen with open hearts. Um, and it, again, it might sound kind of cheesy, um, but that work was transformative. Um, and, and I, um, you know, I think about that. I think about it a lot because it was a really um, powerful work that they did. And I think about it, you know, even in the context of what we're living through in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. Um... Somebody else has asked, uh, just quick, there are so many parallels between your, what you discuss in your book and what's happening here right now in terms of like who's given the power to, to decide what's true and what's not and um, like how we give voices to those who traditionally haven't been allowed to talk about their history. It's, it's like, this is a perfect time, I guess, for this book to come out. Um, okay, somebody asks Dr. Shea, what made you interested in studying history? Um, you know, I was not, I, I wasn't like a great history student and I, um, I had an historian as a mentor in undergrad, uh, the late Eric Schneider, um, and he was a great storyteller and he um, was an historian of people uh, who were not recognized in most tellings of the past. Um, you know, his first book was about um, like children who were convicted of crime in 19th century Boston and the way these kids would sort of like screw the system. Um, and it was just this brilliant reading against the lines of the records that were kept by the juvenile delinquent um, sort of do-gooders um, and muckrakers uh, in order to kind of get at these kids' perspectives. So that certainly got me started. Um, I would say that even though it's not history, Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Yes, I'm listening um, to that right now. Sorry. You are? No yeah. way. That book like changed my life. Um, and it just, it also kind of showed me the power of story um, mm -hmm. and the power of lucid writing 
you know, and I, I, when I decided I wanted to go back to school, I chose history because historians generally write pretty well. And it's a discipline in which writing well is valued um, and writing to an educated, interested audience that may not be an expert in the topic is considered to be an important priority for the discipline for historians. Mm -hmm. um, but the person that I worked closest with in 1998, 1999 in Derry was the historian, Dr. Billy Kelly. Um, and I saw Derry in a lot of ways through his eyes. Um, I took my first Irish history class in the upstairs of the, um, what was it? The PRG, Peace and Reconciliation Group. Um, and that was Billy taught this adult education Irish history class. And that's where I first started sort of my formal learning. So yeah, lots of reasons. Yeah, that's great. Um, that kind of folds into this next question. What are you, mm, so many questions. Uh, okay. What are your thoughts on how Ireland is constructed and retold by the broader Irish diaspora? Uh, did my husband asked that question. Um, I wondered actually if the person asking these questions was him under an alias, to be totally honest with you. I was like, Matthew, is this you? Um, Matthew, is this you? <laughs> you could have um, um, Wow. That's a really great question. Um, you know, I'm like, I, it's another, there's another sort of thing. Um, I think everyone's always like suspicious of Irish Americans and of um, Matthew's got a friend who calls it sham roguery, right? And sort of like this kind of fake Irishness or the plastic patty um, sort of trying to kind of like, you know, um, assert that the Irish are the most oppressed people ever, right? And the Irish are victims and the Irish were enslaved and the Irish were, you know, like all of these things, which just the historical record completely belies and, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I, I think that I think the diaspora, I think the Irish diaspora is a really important lesson for all of us about people's need for roots, people's need to have a sense of belonging, um, people's attraction to story and music and poetry, um, people's attraction to the ways the Irish narrative of loss and redemption is sort of writ large through poetry and literature and drama, um, and also through the, the story of the kind of the creation of the Irish state. Um, you know, I, I wish that the Irish diaspora would, would embrace Ireland of today, you know, Ireland with its, um, you know, like it's, it's queer, it's welcoming of foreigners, it's green, it's, you know, it's, it's like work on climate change, it just puts us to shame. Um, so I, I wish that the diaspora would embrace the things about Ireland that make Ireland what it is today. Mm -hmm. And I fear um, that the diaspora can um, potentially um, either become absolutely pointless and meaningless or potentially become, um, you know, even problematic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, same person asks, with Dairy Girls and the continued interest in American Irish heritage, how do you think those retellings impact the story of cities like Derry and Irish history in general? Well, I think they keep it alive. Um, one of my favorite stories that I like to tell is like, um, I was in, I was living in Derry and I was late to get to a yoga class and I was sort of, you know, walking really quickly down the street and there was this little kid on a skateboard um, and he starts talking to me because that's what you do in Derry. And, um, you know, he says, oh, you're American, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. And he said, are you familiar with our city's history? And I was like, dude, you're eight, but yeah, I am. And he's like, it's class, isn't it? And I was like, yes, it is class. Like, I love your history. I study your history. I'm all about your history. Now I want to go to yoga. Um, but I was just like in, you know, for an eight-year-old kid to be that conscious of the role of it, his history, the history of his city in kind of bringing 
um, foreigners to the city and engaging um, an economy and uh, an art scene and an education scene and all these things that keep dairy vital and sustainable in terms of economics and culture um, and music and all this stuff. I, I think it's I think it's great that history is alive and well. And I, and I think that even, you know, people can stomach all of the plastic patties, the Yanks coming over with their like long, long, long ago Irish roots. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that the conversations that happen like this one around things like Dairy Girls um, can maybe open up some possibility for franker and more honest conversation on both sides of the pond. Yeah. Um, I just finished Dairy Girls today, and boy, was it great. Just love it. So did um, you finish season two? Yeah, I did. All right. Yeah. So can I say one thing? Yeah, you can. All right. <laughs> so like, then I try really hard not to like sit there on the couch and analyze Dairy Girls from yeah. a dairy historian's perspective. And mm -hmm. if you have not finished season two, like cover your ears because there are spoilers. Um, but what's the what's the boy's name? Why am I spacing it right now? James. James. So mm -hmm. James' mom comes back right from London, and she's like full of shit with her stickers, and um and she's like, okay, James, you're coming home with me, and James is like, okay, I'm going home, and um and so they're in the they're in the taxi, and they're in the back of the taxi, and they're driving over the Glenshane Pass, and the Glenshane Pass is this kind of like brutally brutally desolate and beautiful landscape um, that you pass when you're coming out of Derry um, and heading towards kind of the major road to, to Belfast. Um, and I, I, as soon as they were, as soon as it showed that, I was like, he's going back. And Matthew was like, he's not going back. Or I don't know if he's going back. And I was like, no, he's going back. Totally. Mother is slagging Derry and he's driving over the Glenshane Pass. And if there are two things Derry people hate more than anything, it's people slagging dairy and it's leaving dairy and driving through the Glen Chain Pass. He's going back. And so like, sure enough, you know, I'm bawling, you know, as he like cozies he's up on the walls. I'm a dairy girl, um, yeah. I'm so a good. dairy girl. But I was like, yes, totally. Well, and I really liked um, the moment when Michelle told him that he was a dairy girl and that it's not who you are. It's, or it's not, um, you know, our bits are different, but it's a state of mind. I loved that. It's a state of mind. Yeah. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I yeah. studied a lot of, um, I'm really interested in like history as it's presented in film and what um, obligation storytellers have, um, like not documentaries, but sort of films for entertainment, what obligation they have to to tell the official record. Um, so I know what you mean, like sitting there trying to analyze it, but at the same time, is that they're like, are they, is it appropriate for them to be held to that standard? We can have a separate conversation. We don't want to bore everyone else. Bore everyone. But, <laughs> but it's but an it's awesome really conversation that I totally want to have. Yes, with. ditto. Um, it's a great, great show. But uh, there are lots of people who have asked Dairy Girls specific questions. So let me find those again. Uh, somebody has asked, what is your favorite moment from Dairy Girls? Uh, oh my gosh, really? Like you think I could pick just one? Tell us two. Um, okay. So I do like, I mean, in the context of this talk and in the context of my book, um, I think it's hysterical when they go on the retreat with the Protestant kids yes. and the priest who'd been like, you know, sleeping with the yes. beauty, the, the hairdresser is like, what are some things we have in common? And they just cover the whole blackboard with yeah. things that are different. And he's just like, oh, uh -huh. another difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I love, I love Michelle. I'm like, Matthew's, I'm like, oh, I'm probably Michelle. Like, I wish that I was, or not, is it Michelle? Who's the little one? Claire, I love Claire, I'm Claire, I'm not Michelle. I wanna be Michelle. I wish I was Michelle, I'm not Michelle. I'm Claire, mm -hmm. um, but there's the scene <laughs> where they were all gonna like not wear their uniform and yes. then um, Claire shows up and she was like, what? She's like, I don't wanna be an individual by myself. So <laughs> I was like, that is so great. Um, and the scene that makes me like laugh until I cry and I should probably like put on auto repeat for um, the, 
just election. In, that's sinking in as we spend like six more months in lockdown. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the scene where um, the dairy dog pees on oh, the statue God. in the long tower, um, the the like it's not a thing anymore. But back in the day, dairy dogs would just run rampant around the city. They would there would just be packs of dogs. Um, and they were like fairly well behaved and they all had a home. Um, they would just go out and play for the day and then go back. So like the, the, the dog and then the dog running into the church and then the dog, you know, relieving himself on the statue um, beyond just the story that she makes up about the apparition. Um, mm-hmm. It just like, and I went to Catholic school as you did Lily. And so I also have these sort of, you know, experiences of my own with statues and um, and wonderings about miracles and things like that. So I just love that. Sister Michael is real. We all knew Sister Michael. Um, or Sister least, Michael. You know, sure, <laughs> it was Sister Michael. Um, I really love uh, the the scene with Claire, um, or Claire in this particular scene when they're uh, talking to Katya. Mm-hmm. I think the name of the Ukrainian. <laughs> Chernobyl, yeah. the Chernobyl. <laughs> yes, and she's saying, um, she's like, oh, we're so similar because there's so much strife in both of our locations. And she's like, well, Chernobyl was like a horrible nuclear accident and um, you just kill each other for reasons nobody in the world seems to be able to understand. She's like, well, there's like religious and political differences. And she says, uh, it, not different religions though, right? Just different, same religion, different flavors. And Claire has this moment of revelation. <laughs> it is stupid. Why are we doing this? Um, particularly because they had had that retreat and Claire specifically had had this insane moment of misunderstanding with a Protestant boy um, who she thought wanted to murder her. <laughs> and I thought that that was such a beautiful illustration of uh, people and in conflict staying in conflict longer than they probably should have through misunderstandings like that um yeah I th- it's a great show great great show um thank you very much for making me watch it so <laughs> okay Stacy asks can you talk about the process of building trust oh god this is a good question can you talk about the process of building trust among your narrators and how being American uh, impacted their storytelling. Um, Stacy, Stacy's brilliant. Uh, she's a Stacy Zimbrucci is a brilliant oral historian, um, and her book, according to Baba, is one of my favorite books of about oral history. Um, I think it would have been hella harder if I had tried to be um, do kind of contemporary stuff and current stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it took me a long time to get people to know me and trust me in dairy. And I would say even the number of people who know me and trust me is like pretty small. I can probably count them on my fingers and toes, um, but they have been my gatekeepers and they their trust and their sense that I'm a decent person. Um, and I seemed to, from the beginning, um, A, live in a dairy that embraced all different sides of the city and its history, um, moved in in circles that weren't limited, um, but also sort of took really seriously um, the histories of injustice and marginalization. Um, so I think people knowing me made a difference. Um, I honestly think like, as my friend Dermot says, the Lord loves a trier. And there's something about just showing up over and over and over again, being like, please, please, can I talk to you? Please, can I look in your archive? Please, Mm -hmm. can I, you know, it's, there's something like uh, just about the sheer stamina of not giving up um, that I think in the end really helped. And, And I also think I had like some really good luck, you know, sometimes some things just came my way, um, by sheer happenstance. And so, um, you know, I want to believe who knows if it's true or not, but whatever, we all tell ourselves things to keep us going and get us up in the morning. But I do want to believe that, um, that this was a history and a story um, that, that I was prepared to tell. Um, and, and that my experience in dairy before I was a student, and before I was a scholar, 
uh, really made a lot of difference. I will always remember um, Patty Bogside Doherty saying to a group of people, if I had 10 pence for every PhD that came into dairy and tried to open up our brains and then went away to write a book about it, we'd have no economic troubles here at all. Um, mm -hmm. And that was, that was something that really struck me. And I knew that I didn't want to be that kind of person and I didn't want to be that kind of academic. Mm -hmm. um, but sure, I mean, there are people who to this day have, wouldn't talk to me and won't talk to me. Um, and sometimes I would ask questions and they would point me to a book, which obviously I had already read, right? right? right. And so yeah. who knows what, if that's because I'm American, if that's because I'm a woman, if that's because I, you know, was young when I started, who knows? Right. Um, unfortunately, it's we've gone 10 minutes over because I wanted to ask a follow up on that because weren't you involved in a really fascinating situation with Northeastern and, and Ireland trying to get the names of uh, people who had spoken for an oral history project, but who were like members of the Oh, I was not involved. That was Boston College, oh, 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 Boston the Belfast College. Project. I wrote about it. I wrote about it as a what I not to do. At the time. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I wrote about it as a what not to do for oral historians. Um, so yeah, people who don't know about that, Google it, Belfast Project, Boston College Archives. Um, you know, it was really, really eye-opening and probably will make a lot of people think twice or three times or 50 times before they talk to an oral historian in a conflict situation again. Yeah, uh, really do look it up. It's fascinating and horrifying. You can't look away. Um, so because we've gone over, I guess we should wrap it up. But thank you so much, Margo. I want to say I'm sorry to Holly, who asked you way more questions that I wasn't able to get to because um, I was trying to go through other people's as well. Uh, I'll, um, I'll pass those along to Margo and maybe she can like write an answer, but I'm not holding her to that. I'm just saying maybe. Thank you so, so much for joining us and talking about your book. Uh, hopefully the library will have a copy soon and then people can read it, starting with me. Because um, it just seems like it's gonna be great. I hope it does really well. And I, I hope the people in Derry are proud to be represented by you, I suppose. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so, so much for joining us. Guys, I guess we're gonna wrap it up and um, thank you all for joining the two of us. Uh, we Thanks, everybody. appreciate you being here. Yes, and thank you for the really interesting questions. That was really yeah. cool. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Malden Public Library. Thank you, everybody out in, uh, in TV land. I always wanted to say that. Um, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.